Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the third session of our second edition of Love is Political, Literary Circles for Liberation. Um, we are currently reading Olga Segura's uh, book, Birth of a Movement, Black Lives Matter and the Catholic Church. As always, please remember to keep yourselves muted so we can avoid any background noise. My name is Roxana Vendesu. I use she, her pronouns. My ancestors are the Quechuas from the Andes of Peru. I was born and raised for the most part in Lima. Um, I'm excited to be here with all of you again to engage in this bi-weekly collective reflection. Um, I would like to invite our dear friend Rosemary Pace to share a prayer with us. Rosemary is a longtime member of Pax Christi and has had many roles throughout the years. Um, currently, she is serving as the coordinator of Pax Christi New York State. Rosemary? A prayer for racial justice from the Social Justice Resource Center. When our eyes do not see the gravity of racial injustice, shake us from our slumber and open our eyes, O oh God. When out of fear we are frozen into inaction, give us a spirit of bravery, O oh God. When we try our best but say the wrong things, give us a spirit of humility, O oh God. When the chaos of this dies down, give us a lasting spirit of solidarity, O oh God. When it becomes easier to point fingers outward, help us to examine our own hearts, O oh God. God of truth, in your wisdom, enlighten us. God of love, in your mercy, forgive us. God of hope, in your kindness, heal us. Creator of all people, in your generosity, guide us. Racism breaks your heart. Break our hearts for what breaks yours, O oh God. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, what a beautiful prayer you've shared with us. Well, now, in, as it's customary, I would like for us to read our statement of principles. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, and and who would like to go first? A liberating vision. Our commitment to follow in the footsteps and example of Jesus, born to a people suffering oppression, forced to cross borders as a refugee, devoted to supporting the struggles of marginalized people, persecuted and violently killed by the ruling empire, guides our discernment of the current signs of the times and leads us to affirm the following. With land acknowledgement, Pax Christi USA wishes to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the indigenous peoples, past and present who have stewarded Turtle Island, a territory that includes what is currently known as the United States of America. We recognize and uplift the understanding that much of this land continues to be unceded and that many indigenous peoples nations currently lack federal recognition. Thank you. Acknowledgement of the legacy of slavery. Pax Christi USA wishes to acknowledge the despicable actions of the transatlantic trade stra slave trade that paved the way for current and anti-Black racism. The labor of enslaved African people built the physical structures and generated the wealth still enjoyed by many of this country's institutions and families. We recognize that while many Catholics were abolitionists, Still others profited from this shameful practice and white people continue to benefit from its legacy to this day. Thank you. I'll do it. Acknowledgement of the role of the Catholic Church. Pax Christi USA wishes to acknowledge and repent for the role of the institution of the Catholic Church in the process of colonization 
and its complicity in the sins of anti-Black racism, enslavement, and segregation. We commit ourselves to follow the leadership of Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color, including those within the church, and to support them with intention, time, and money in the struggle for collective liberation. Thank you. Now, our second page. On racial uh, justice, racism penetrates every aspect of life in the United States, seeding the terror that continually threatens and kills people of color while perpetuating white supremacy and leaving all of humanity disfigured. The historical reality readily apparent in policing, the prison system, education, and highlighted in the racial inequities heightened during the pandemic, indicts our society as one in which Black lives have not mattered. We assert that Black lives matter and that the violence inherent in systemic racism is an affront to the God who creates, redeems, and sanctifies all and calls us together as one family. As a community of conscience, we stand together and fully support the divestment of resources away from policing and toward education, healthcare, and community investment uh, designed to serve people. We support reparations for the suffering inflicted on black people because of slavery, Jim Crow laws, and targeted mass incarceration. Thank you. Thank you for reading that. Um, to me, it's such an important effort to center uh, what we've put together uh, collectively. And um, it's important for us to, to ground ourselves before having these conversations. Um, and I think we've been doing a fairly good job. I uh, hope you agree. Um, we are going to continue now our conversation with a member of our um, our. our our organization. Um, his name is Isaac Chandler, uh, and he's going to join us now. Uh, Isaac uses he, him pronouns and is our national council chair. He's a high school science teacher from Jasper, Florida, a longtime member of Pax Christi USA, and has served in various groups, including the Pax Christi Anti-Racism Team, PCARD, uh, the Youth and Young Adult Forum, and has also served on the Planning and Programming Committee for the 2012 National Assembly in Atlanta, Georgia. And now I'm going to bring Isaac in so everybody can see him here. Hello, Isaac, how are you doing? You're on mute right now. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, no. You're on mute. I'm muted. Sorry go. about that. Hey, I'm good. How are you all tonight? Thank you for asking me to be here, Roxana. Well, I, I know that you've been, uh, you know, joining these conversations uh, since the beginning, and that shows that this is very important to you, of course. And, you know, first of all, what, what moves you to be part of this conversation? Um, you know, I guess... Um, you know, the one thing I, I've seen is that I'm still learning so much about myself and what my role is as far as my role within the church, my church, um, when doing all of, when discussing such a very, very important topic of dealing with race. Um, I think too many times people you know, don't know how to discuss race, don't want to discuss race, um, or don't want to go deep enough in the discussions of race. And I know that working, the things that I've been doing with Pox Christi USA, especially within the anti-racism team and within our own council, um, you know, and just the way things have just unfolded in the past two or three years, I can't stand by and do nothing and continue to be silent. I just feel like this is that moment in time where everything has just sort of started to come together to come to fruition. And I'm learning so much more about uh, issues and how all of these issues that I care about 
um, how race has played such a huge role. Um, as you say, I am a science teacher by occupation. Um, a lot of the work that I've done um, study-wise or collegiate-wise deals with the environmental science and environmental um, background and so forth. And I'm starting to realize even more how race has played uh, such a role in our environment and in within our ecosystem. Um, and, you know, um, I had never heard the term environmental racism until I was in college, um, until I was a 20, 21, 22 year old man. I had never heard the term environmental racism, but it has stuck with me um, for some time now, just seeing how race has played a role in um, where resources have been placed and where things like pollutants and so forth have become impactful in the community, um, where certain things are placed in the community that can have adverse effects on health and so forth and so on. Um, and recently I've been reading a number of articles uh, looking at just some of the ways that even subtly for folks of color uh, to be able to enjoy the outdoors and to be able to feel safe in wild spaces and so forth has certainly um, brought a lot of other things home to me. And I know that there are folks out there that say, you know, this is just more of this whole fake wokeness. But I think a in a lot of ways, it illustrates just how insidious and just how uh, subversive racism is and how it, it has played a role in how people like myself look at the outdoors and being able to enjoy the outdoors um, and being able to partake into the outdoors. Because let's face it, we've all heard the stories or maybe we're aware of the stories about how those of us that go into the woods and disappear, go into the woods in certain times of the year, you know, and then we're found hanging from a tree or murdered um, without any, um, you know, with, with such impunity and where these cases have become unsolved, unmarked graves where our bodies have lain, um, where we've tried to participate in things like camping and so forth, and yet uh, our presence is questioned. Um, and of course, that certainly uh, gelled together with the whole thing with the gentleman in New York City Park who was a bird watcher, um, who, you know, this woman called the police on him because of what because he dared to question the fact that she had her dog without a leash. He was being the um lawful one. He knew the rules, he knew the whatever, but yet still his presence was being questioned. Now, how could that have gone a different way if he wouldn't have recorded this whole thing and the police were to be called on him? You know, I think about the years that I worked um, or the, 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 the year that I worked as a uh, biologist and had to go into the woods and so forth, you know, um, was I taking my life into my own hands to be able to go out into the woods and to survey and to uh, whatever, because somebody would be afraid that my presence would be here. Um, you know, so again, I think all of these things together combined have given me sort of an awareness that just how pervasive racism is, even in certain ways that you might not even think uh, whatever. And the whole fact that there's now this whole attack on the 1619 project, um, you know, where, you know, I think people are given the opportunity to sort of learn other aspects of our history and just to sort of see 
how racism has shaped systems and so forth. You know, again, I understand when folks tell me that people aren't going out necessarily and saying and being overt with their racism, so forth and whatnot, and there are laws to prevent that, but yet there's really no laws to prevent the sort of covert racism or how racism has just sort of gone underground and how racism has played systematically and institutionally. And I think in order to continue this conversation about race, folks need to understand how that has played out. And so this sort of pushback on learning a new way of history because people are afraid that folks are going to be mad and upset and it's going to cause division. Listen, like I once told somebody, if roots in the 1970s wasn't enough to cause Black folks to want to go out and be angry and mad at white folk, then I think we're okay. I really, I really think we're going to be okay. And I mean, I don't think roots uh, in the 1970s caused us to go out and want to go out and get white folk and cause a whole lot of division. If anything, I hope it helped to bridge some understanding. And so I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping that folks will sort of see that just to sort of understand how these things play about and how you may be complicit, whether or consciously or unconsciously, is um, will become more and more important. So I guess that's why I I really choose I've really come in to just sort of be here in this moment because I want to learn and I want to be able to teach. Um, you know, I thought I knew quite a bit when I first joined the Christian anti-racism team back in 2004, but I learned more and more and I'm still learning more and more and sort of learning to unpack a lot of this stuff. And um, it's been through the help of my other fellow Catholic brothers and sisters, not only those of color, but those white allies uh, to help me learn to sort of unpack these things and to think more critically when it comes um, to these issues. And I'm sorry, I've kind of gone on and on. I apologize. No, you know, that's perfectly fine. And, and I really love what you are talking about because you're already talking about intersectionality, right? Like which uh, uh, Olga mentions in the book and how important it is. Of course, she talks about uh, the aspect that relates to medicine and how, you know, uh, there were horrible experiments done on uh, Black uh, bodies and how, well, we have to have when one uh, very high profile person, a tennis player who had a, an, an issue with that, with the fact that she let her doctor know what she was going through after, I believe, giving birth. Uh, and this was one of the uh, Williams sisters, and they weren't taking action on what she uh, told them. And she obviously is a person who knows really well her own body um, and was able to give them all the information in detail, and they did not take action. And so that, uh, you know, it happened to a person with a very high profile, but it happens every day, right? Every day. And again, this is a person with money. Because there are all these people that want to say, well, it's because these folks are poor and they have to go to the free clinic and the doctors are not educated. No, this is a rich woman who is probably one of the richest women in the world, richest athletes in the world. And yet and still, this woman almost died giving birth. Yeah. So, you know, if we want to sit up here and have conversations about uh abortions and pro-life and whatever else, you know, um, I think it's also important to just sort of have this conversation, especially as when it comes to women of color, uh, especially black women of color to, can we just get these women to just get decent healthcare, period. Not being able to, and I don't mean to say enjoy in a, in a laissez-faire term, but before we even get to whether or not they're even able to be suggested for an abortion, you know, can we get have a conversation about prenatal care? Can we talk about pain management? Can we talk about, you know, things that you need to be doing to take care of your baby? 
advocating for yourself, being listened to by your doctors, and being avoid, respected avoid as it. someone who knows your own body. Right, but right. no, we're still, you know, Black women are still having to deal with this whole concept of Black people having thicker skin, Black people having uh, 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 no, high pain tolerance. Uh, Come on. No, yeah. Garbage. But again, that goes back to slavery and slave days. Mm -hmm. These folks were, were, you know, they, they came from a people that were able to work long in the fields and could stand the heat and could do this and do that and deal with hard labor. They're built for this. And even this concept of, uh, of resiliency. Yeah, like, right, like we, you know, have to gather strength, uh, you know, all human beings have to gather strength and, and, and to continue going when something horrible happens. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's no trauma there. That doesn't mean that you don't hurt. That doesn't mean, and this is the same for all human beings, right? It's no less for uh, black people, no less for people of color um, as a whole, this is, you know, we also get tired. We also uh, feel pain. We also suffer. We also have trauma. Um, and so when people, you know, talk about resiliency, they really have to consider that being resilient doesn't mean that you uh, you can put more on somebody, right? Like you, you can just uh, get more of their energy or, or, or be like, well, get over that. No, like, let's not do that. Let's work on this. Let's 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 find support, right? Let's let's find resources for to support right. people who are going through various struggles. And again, that's some of the reason why a number of us still don't feel like we need to go to the doctor. We have herbs, we have um, you know, natural medicines and things like that. This is one of the reasons why we don't in the black community or still in certain portions of the black community, we've not come to grips when it comes to things like, here we go, mental health. Right. And understanding, you know, sometimes it's okay not to be okay. No, we're, you know, we're just supposed to deal with it because we've dealt with it for 400 plus years, you know, you know, but we all have our breaking points. I think we all understand that. And again, we have bad days just like everybody else does. But again, there's that whole concept of who can have a bad day and who's just being um, a troublemaker or problematic. Right. Right. Yeah. And in this, you can see this uh, when they're, you know, with the with the shootings that happen all the time in this country, um, and how they label a person uh, a terrorist, you know, and but a person who is not a person, but a person who's white, uh, usually is a troubled teenager or you know troubled, having a bad day. Maybe all of us are having a bad day, but you know, we all have bad days. Society not focusing on. Uh, mental health, right? Um, it, but but also, uh, Isaac, I, I wanted to ask you. So, as an educator, this there's an interesting um, passage here uh, that Olga writes. It says, "Textbooks used in American classrooms indoctrinate young girls and boys with narratives more interested in emphasizing the compassion of enslavers than the cruelty endured by the enslaved." Uh, and this is something that, uh, see, uh, historian Cynthia Greenlee uh, wrote in 2019. Um, and it says also, textbooks have long remained a battleground in which the humanity and status of Black Americans have been contested. Pedagogy has always been predominantly, uh, preeminently uh, political. Uh, it, and it, it also says that 1619 Project helped me to unlearn false histories and gave me a lens from which to critique more fully my Catholic education, as well as my church and its leaders, and to learn about the church's history with racism and the sin of slavery. What, what are your thoughts on this? 
So it's really interesting that you say this. I just came from, um, I had dinner with a friend of mine a day or so ago, and she and I were talking about how, so her young children went to a private school, a church school uh, for, um, for kindergarten uh, young at a young age. And she mentions one day they had what they call a free Friday where they could dress up whom they wanted to be, what little characters and whatever that they wanted to be. And her daughter had a whole crush on Pocahontas. And, you know, and she wanted to come dressed as Pocahontas. Well, apparently there was an issue with her dressing up as Pocahontas because I think of some of the Native American imagery and because I guess some of the imagery implied mysticism. Mysticism. And so, you know, um, my friend who I, uh, name, I'm going to call her name, her name is Carla. We've been friends for years. Um, sweet woman, wonderful woman of God, um, smart as a whip. Uh, I don't think they realized whom they were dealing with because then she came back at them and said, huh, well, Pocahontas shows mysticism. Hmm, interesting. So, and I guess you feel the same way about Jasmine from Aladdin, mysticism once again, but yet you have no problems with Sleeping Beauty. Snow White. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, there were witches in there. And then in Sleeping Beauty, the witch Maleficent turned into a dragon. And prick, and it was talking about the whole pricking of the finger of the spinning wheel and dying. So that doesn't imply mysticism. Hmm. Interesting. So I think the commonality here is you have a problem with brown folk with mysticism, but nothing with blonde hair, blue eyed. Uh, young girls or, or brunette young girls with skin of white and their mysticism. Um, so again, I'm, um, you know, I, I found that really, really interesting uh, to say, I don't teach history. I have some history teachers um, that are friends of mine and I've never really quite gotten exactly what they talked about as far as slavery. Now, I can't really, I personally can't say whether or not I feel as though the talk of with slavery has been sympathetic towards slave owners, but uh, the whole concept of the South fighting for states' rights, not slavery, but states' rights and um, economics and so forth and whatever, but yet the economics was built on enslavement of people, chattel slavery of people, mistreatment of people. I don't think they really deal too much in that. And, you know, part of that is I think because we've shifted the discussion when it comes to education, let's face it, a lot of education in the country of the United States of America we live in is all based on passing a test. It's all based on passing some sort of performance test. And listen, I understand it, I get it. I had an achievement test when I was in school. I get that. But these sort of standard-based tests where you have to teach this, 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 this standard, and sometimes we, we do that to the detriment of really going into details about things that really happen. We deal with dates, we deal with people, prominent people, you know, and we don't really necessarily go too much in depth in that. Um, I'm a little, you know, one of the things that does kind of make me very, very uneasy is you all have heard of the people's history of the United States by the Zen, uh, Peter Zen or uh, Howard Zen, Howard. right. Uh, but did you also know that there is a Patriots history of the United States? Well, we teach that book. Well, that book is prominent in one of the junior colleges that they do uh, um, dual enrollment in. 
And it's it's very, very interesting. The Patriots history. Hmm. So you can imagine what type of tilt that book probably leans towards. So, um, you know, again, I think there's a lot of things coming into play here. I, I think um I I do I believe that a, a lot of the focus, especially when it comes to history and the history exam, is all a lot of dates and things and you know you only have so much that you have to be able to teach within the year before you know the year is almost over and then you have to do the test so there's not a whole lot of room for a lot of extra time to do a lot of extra stuff and then you know frankly speaking you're right a lot of the textbooks leave out of the new leave out a lot of nuances when it comes to a lot of this stuff and you know um you know, black people really don't really ever really get interested, except, you know, maybe one or two times, about three times during the whole book. We might talk about, we'll talk about the first folks that came over in 1619, you know, even though there were Africans that were here since the 1500s. I mean, you can go back to uh, the founding of St. Augustine um, and talk about that, uh, you know, um, or even the fact that there were African peoples that were on the ship with Columbus in 1492 um, and so forth. So we might talk about the first indigenous people, uh, first slaves that came over in 1619. We will talk about them then. You might get a mention of Christmas addicts in 1775 before, um, before uh, uh, Lexington, where did he die? Was it Lexington? I can't remember. Uh, you might mention it there. You'll get a passing mention of people of color, maybe. Uh, um, and when we talk about the Civil War, Reconstruction, maybe a little bit, uh, whatever. You might get Dred Scott mentioned after that. Um, and then, of course, we've gone away again until Martin Luther King. And the, and the interesting thing is that uh, when they talk about, you know, slavery, uh, uh, just racism in general, they talk about it as if it was in the past, right? Like, we have overcome this. And now, you know, you had Obama. And, you know, now Kamala is here. So that's, that was back in the past. So just, you know, get over it. And it's like, whoa, no, like this is systemic. It doesn't matter who's up there actually, this is systemic. Um, so, you know, it, it's such a, a, a limited, a very like obtuse understanding of what uh, communities are going through. Um, so, you know, and even, um, the other things that they uh, leave out are, you know, a lot of the, the people of color, uh, particularly black people who have contributed to, to of course, science, uh, uh, to, uh, of course, to th the concept of democracy, which started in Egypt, like, you know, all these ideas that are uplifted uh, and understood sort of like a, from, a, from a, a white perspective or, you know, a, a Western lens uh, are actually, uh, many of them were either influenced or began in countries uh, in the global south, in uh, territories in the global south, even before, you know, this ideas of, of nations and borders. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's very interesting to me. And, and I'm sure you, you see this in the educational system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, and I know so, you don't yeah. teach history, but but it, it, you you see it as in so many uh, in so many different spaces, right? Uh, where people of color are not really uplifted, um, and there's a reason for that. A lot of the the walls are never going to uplift the people who, uh, because of white supremacy, were in roles of. Uh, you know what that were seen as less even going there right uh people who were doing uh the 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 cleaning who people who right now are are picking the the, the crops people who are literally keeping us alive right uh we have all of that that it's not going in the walls of achievers it's not really going in in the in the rooms of people getting right, because uh, they weren't the big the people making the big decisions in the room 
room. You know, they weren't the ones that were in the room writing the Constitution. So this is why, you know, and of course, that's always the excuse that folks say. These were the guys in the room. These were the ones showing the, the leadership to build and whatever and da 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 But again, it is, you know, but again, you, you definitely say it is those other folks who work behind the scenes. And I think, you know, to be honest with you, if I can pull at least one positive thing from this whole thing about the pandemic, is those were the folks that were keeping us maintained. And a lot of them were the people of color. They were the uh, domestics. They were the fast food workers. They were the garbage collectors who were keeping us safe and protecting us from dangerous and deadly microbes and all other kinds of things. Um, it was the farm workers who were going out and picking crops to make sure that we got fresh fruits and vegetables into our stores and so forth. So if anything, I think one of the things that this pandemic should have showed us is that we need everybody. Yeah, yeah. We and need everybody. Yeah. We, need, we needed those scientists, but we also needed the blue collar workers to help keep us keep this country going. We needed everybody. In this, in this terminology that we are so used to, right, of, of uh, low skill workers versus high skill, like, what does that even mean in the real world, actually? Without this low skill workers, we wouldn't be able to be, to nourish our bodies, period. So how low skill are they? What would you do without that skill, actually, in the world? Right, and somebody here, uh, Rosa Manriquez, mentions farm workers have received no money. No money. Stimulus money, none. Um, and and, and yeah, again, no a lot of that just has to do with the system that's in place because unfortunately, a lot of these folks are getting paid under the table because, you know, if, if they were done as real, you know, as, as what they should have been done as employees, their employer would have had to pay some sort of taxes on them or whatever, and give them benefits. How about that? You know, give them benefits, but nah, we'll just sort of pay them under the table, pay them what we want. They get no benefits. And I don't actually, have to worry about them. Some of them have a, a document that is called ITIN and they actually pay taxes, which will never, they will never receive any benefit from it. Um, and so there's that whole other conversation. Right, that to have. right. Right. Um, they I, have I been paying taxes. Right. Centering back to, uh, you know, Black lives, but uh, the reason why we're here and remembering what you mentioned, the sanitation workers and how uh, actually the last uh, struggle that uh, Dr. King supporter, supported was the struggle of sanitation workers, right? And, and, and there was a really interesting connection there because he was murdered when he was getting into this deep deeper analysis of uh, criticizing the economic model. And that is a sin here, right? Exactly. And we could also make a same parallel, you know, and maybe it wasn't so much the economics, but challenging what he had been told before. Malcolm X made the trip to Mecca and found out that it wasn't just Muslims who were black that were in the struggle together. It was Muslims from different variations, different colors, different countries, different nationalities, whatever. And then when his eyes got open and he was going to tell those truths, that's when he was murdered. Right. So again, when you start to hit people's pocketbooks is when there's an issue. Exactly. You know, we also have to mention uh, the, 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 the letter um, from the bishops that Olga mentions in, in this, uh, I think, third chapter, um, where, you know, they really didn't, uh, and I'm just going to quote it here, uh, it says, the letter's vague policy demands further demonstrate how removed these leaders are from the organizers and policymakers who are calling for the abolition of the US police departments. By aligning law enforcement with justice and the fight for the common good, quote, 
the bishops are once again willfully ignoring the lived experience of Black Catholics. You know, he, she mentions also uh, one of the biggest misconceptions I encounter in my reporting by both uh, white and non-white Catholics is the idea that police departments are inherently moral and that their officers serve in the name of justice, regardless of skin color or race. This is both a historical and dangerous. Our contemporary church fathers cannot disregard the violent history of policing anymore. The anymore than than we can ignore the Catholic Church's role in American chattel slavery. Mm. I just want to first. I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, Sister Manriquez when she calls it copaganda. That's really interesting. I it's like in that the book as well. Yeah, it's in the ah. Book. Yeah. I like that. I, I must have missed that. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So again. You know, and I think one of the things, because we actually looked at the letter, the most recent letter, and I think, again, um, you see institutionally and systematically why the letter was not, some of the problems with such a letter. First of all, you know, I think it's great when we want to do documents and when we want to make statements, and I, I understand that, you know, that being involved with, you know, in certain workplace things, you have a document that anti-discriminatory and we we hate this and we don't do this and we da 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 But, you know, you've done all this, but it has no teeth. It has no sort of legal footing to allow someone who feels like they've been discriminated against or whatever to be able to use that document to come about any justice so really you just you've just put out a, a document just to make yourself feel good i think some of the problems that i think a number of people came up with is who was involved in writing the document did you have church leaders church lay leaders who really had been studying and working on this thing to play a role in the construction of this letter and then after you have a committee do it, then you had a higher committee, which I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm wondering what was the makeup of that higher committee of bishops that went through and then, you know, pulled out this and that, you know, in a sense, sanitized the letter in a sense to make it affable to them. So again, I think the process was flawed. And the process was inherently racist and, and so forth and so on as far as how, whatever. I think, you know, I, I think s someone just said it. I, I think when we deal with racism and talk about racism, we always talk about what racism does to people of color, which, you know, I get it. It's important. We can talk about it makes it makes people of color, it, demain, it dehumanizes, it, um, it dehumanizes people of color, debases human, uh, people of color, and so forth and so on. But I think the other, the other, one of the other parts of that conversation need to be this: what does racism do for white people? And I think that is what where a conversation really needs to happen. What does white, what does racism do for white people? And I think that's that's where there's a lot of fear to that because. What consciously or unconsciously, I think to really unpack what racism does for you as a white person, and you can talk about that privilege and that power that comes with that, uh, how your comfort or feelings of comfort may come at the expense of people of color. I think that's where folks really, really have a hard time. I think we get it when it comes to what it does to people of color and how harmful it is, but yet we can't really look at what it does for white people because I think um, I think part of the problem is then you start looking at the sort of subtleties of it. Or sometimes racism is not bad things and not necessarily evil things, but it's very, very subtle and it's very, very insidious how it plays out. So it may not play out as something bad or as something that's hurtful or hatefully 
uh, overtly, but and, it's and what it, but it, what it does inner inside of it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's this uh, this uh, term right that uh, is microaggressions, and I think uh, all people of color know what I mean. This constant, you know, daily microaggressions that we have to face uh, when someone you know, maybe doesn't, I don't know, keep a door open, someone doesn't um, uh, acknowledge our presence, doesn't doesn't hear what we actually are trying to say, doesn't care about our opinions. Um, it, it, all these like microaggressions also, we have to keep in mind, right? Obviously, as, as well as the systemic issues, which that's why we're here, right? But 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 yeah, that small aspect, you know, it's it's also important, it's critical, and we have to uh, make sure that we, um, as a as a as a collective, start acknowledging that and do um, not only not only try to you know do well, but try to do much better because you owe that, you know. Try to do extra, extra good, extra better, because that that's just what we need. We need reparations, right? In 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 all ways, in all aspects, in all spaces. Um. So one of the things that um. Well, I should mention that uh, uh, Olga um, mentions um. Sister Patty, Sister Patricia Ch Chappelle, um, in her book as well, and you know, talks about how for years Black and Brown religious women and men have aligned themselves fully with the fight for racial justice, including Sister Patricia Chappelle, a member of the Sisters of Notre Dame, um, the Reverend Brian Massingale, a priest and theologian, and Sister Norma Pimentel, and and so it's it's a, a really great to hear. Uh, the name of Sister Patty here, right? Um, and acknowledge that that work that she's um, that Please. she's done for so long. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention before we're running out of time now, but uh, something hopeful, right? This piece that is really hopeful. She she says on page fifty one, we remain because we have believed in a better, more liberated church than many of our church father, fathers can envision. For we are the faithful, we are the Catholics who lift and carry this institution from the chains of slavery to border cages. We are the faces and bodies of Jesus. Listen to our cries and declare that the Catholic church is committed to black liberation, that black lives matter. What are your thoughts on this, Isaac? You know, I, I guess I, I guess personally for me, I I do remain hopeful because you know, I feel like you know I was, I was born and raised in this church. This is my church. This is my church home. Um, you know, I've, I've seen other, I've seen just other faiths and how they work and how they go about, um, this is just where I feel comfortable, um, and whatever, but, um, you know, but there are times where I do wonder why I stay and I, I just have to be very, very honest with you, but groups like this help, uh, being involved in Pax Christi. Um, have helped, especially when you start looking at the intersectionality of a lot of these issues. And I think that's where this becomes extremely important to understand that, you know, because, you know, racism is very, is a very, very complex subject. And it, it has several different levels. And when you look at all of the issues surrounding um, the lives of people of color, when you look at um, economic justice, and when you look at environmental justice, and when you look at, um, you know, violence, gun violence, and um, and you see those connectedness and how it all connects in um, the perceived superiority of one race over another, um, 
you know, that people are talking about this and addressing those things, it definitely um, is a sign of hope um, and the possibility of sort of a revolution happening um, within the church. Um, and to be a part of this is certainly exciting, but it's, it's definitely, um, you know, but it, it can be a little bit disheartening at times, but I'm hoping that folks continue to be energized um, by it. Like I said, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm so pleased to be able to be a part of this discussion and that we're going to have um, Dr. Segura or Mrs. Segura uh, come with us mm -hmm. and speak with us at our conference um, in little less than a month, in a little more than a month away. Um, I'm, I'm so, um, yes. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, th those type things just continue to give me hope. And then just, you know, hearing the words of our own Bishop president and some of the things that he said and his leadership, um, so much of this. And, you know, I, I can't say enough about people like Brian Massengill and, and Sister Patty Chappelle for continuing to provide that type of leadership that is so desperately and critically needed during this time and these folks need us and we need to amplify their voices with our voices exactly uh, and you know th this is the perfect way to to end this segment because it is uh because of people like you taking this roles taking this taking time out of your really busy schedule i mean being an educator i know can be incredibly stressful uh <laughs> at the very least. And so for you to dedicate this time to share with us uh, your your wisdom, your knowledge about, you know, your own lived experience is what 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 we need to to get this to continue this work uh, yeah. for collective liberation. And so I want everybody to uh, 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 unmute yourselves and really thank Isaac for this amazing presentation uh, and, and sharing that he's done today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you all so much. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, it's an honor to be here and to be honored uh, to be here with um, the people of Pax Christi USA and those who are not and the, to those who are allies of what we are about and so forth and so on. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And now it's time for y'all to have your discussions. I'm going to send you to the small groups and I hope everybody did their homework and brought a, a question, a, ref, a reflection um, in some, something that you can share with others uh, so you can get that conversation started. Uh, and so now I'm going to create these rooms here and you can just click accept and you'll be taken to your room. We will, I will see you at 8.25 and we will do a, a, a brief closing. Woo, how was that? <laughs> was that great? That was amazing. Oh, not only about, you know, having a conversation, right? This is also about building community and being with each other and be in, bring honesty to the space and bring your true selves and uh, just, yeah, all the questions and, and I, this is the right space for that. So what I want to do in the last few minutes that we have left is, as always, um, ask folks to, uh, in with one word or one line um, or just one small, you know, a couple of sentences maybe, tell us uh, some, your reflections about uh, your groups, your conversations. And you can unmute yourselves. I would like to start, and I would call it a call to action. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I would like to say that we in Pax Christi write a draft of a pastoral letter that would speak as if the bishops were being truly honest to the gospels, the prophets, and to each other. Mm, amen. I, I'd like to add, um, little acts of charity. So we were trying to stay hopeful in the direction of the church. 
And I'd like to piggyback on Arthur. You know, when the bishops in Appalachia stopped writing their combined um, reflection, the people of Appalachia did wrote their own big pastorals. So a uh, great idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other side there. of that is the importance of listening to the people who are most affected by those things that are wrong in our system. Yes. I love the reminder that we are the church. Mm -hmm. The Catholic, the, the Catholic, the black community, Catholic black community has much to be proud of over the years. I'd like to see Rome ask forgiveness for the papal bull of Pope Nicholas V back in the 1500s. Mm. I would like, we would include in the letters when we write to the bishops, Dan Berrigan's beautiful last sentence, bread gets inside humans. And Jesus would never ever turn anybody away. He was inclusive and most welcoming. And we as followers need to emphasize that in our letters. I did not include this in our group, but I would like to see more people, more of us Catholics that have stayed. Referring to the members of the USCCB less by their titles and more as our brothers, because somehow titles have been making the hats higher and pointier and they were baptized our brothers. And that's how we are to speak to each other as siblings. Amen. Thank you for all of these reflections. One other, a, a, a couple seconds for uh, others to, to share. Oh, can I double dip and say, Saul Alinsky would do some things in Rules for Radicals. So maybe we should or send a little donation to our local parish and have mass offered for openness and, um, and questioning, for a more open and questioning hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all of your reflections. Um, now, I would love for y'all to open your mics and say hello to each other as it's customary now. We're going to stop recording so we can do that. <laughs>